Good morning, everybody. Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. We're so excited that you're here. Won't you stand with us? We've got a great hour and some couple of minutes planned together. We're going to worship our God. Let's get ready to give Him the praise and honor He deserves. Come on, let's put our hands together. Sing with us, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. He's so good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Come on, let's declare, Lord, you are good. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Yeah. 
to the world the Lord is come. Let earth receive her Take your seats. You've got to love a, a bit of Christmas pre-caroling. I think that that's the right title to call that. Uh, good morning. Good morning. If we haven't met before, my name's Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Family Church. It is so good to have you with us uh, this Sunday morning. I just want to take a moment to greet those of you who are joining us online from wherever you are in the world. Welcome. Uh, it really is so good to have you with us. And I really want to encourage you. Uh, there's an online host who's there. Uh, why don't you just send them a message, say hi, say happy pre-Christmas, uh, whatever the appropriate greeting is at this time of the year. Um, but we didn't just uh, encourage you to connect with them. And it is so good to have you with us. We're going to continue in this attitude of worship um, as we prepare to, to give now in our tithes and offerings. I know that at this time of the month, as it's around payday and prepay day and all those things, uh, many of you do give online by EFT or through your online banking. And so we acknowledge that. Uh, but for those of you who give during the service, I want to encourage you to prepare for that now. Uh, but just before we do, um, it, it's Christmas in two days' time. Now, if that's news to you, uh, welcome. I hope that you've learned something today and that you'll take that little thought away with you. Um, we went to Gateway yesterday. Poor decision. Um, we went at 9 o'clock, though. Katia went at 3 o'clock, though. Um, just don't go to Gateway. If you're in town uh, visiting us, welcome. Don't go to Gateway. Um, just don't do it. But uh, we were there buying a few Christmas gifts, uh, little last-minute things, but um, our little one's two years old, little girl. And, and so we've got the Christmas tree, and, and, and underneath the Christmas tree are so many gifts for her. None for me, 
None for my wife, none for any of the other family that are joining us. It's basically just for her. And as we were buying like little bits and bobs for her gift and like really some of this stuff, um, if I'm honest, it's because I think it's really cool. Like a doctor's kit because I wanted to like have a stethoscope. And, and so many of these gifts are like amazing, right? And, and I'm so excited about them. And, and the reality is that she's going to open them and play with the paper and not the gift. <laughs> you know the deal. Like they get, they get this amazing like toy house and then they play with the box. But there's something about that moment of buying the gift for someone who may not even understand the receiving of it, but, but you're filled with a sense of joy and wonder and gratitude as you're able to give the gift. I think so much of Christmas is actually the wonder of buying something that you know someone may value. Now, they may not value it, like my little two-year-old will likely not value the gifts that she's been given, but there's something in my heart that, that responds to that moment. And that's similar to, to moments like this in a service where we get to give and, and whether you give online, but, but really God's not in this for, for him. There's something in our giving, there's something in that moment of generosity that fosters a, a response in our own hearts. It's not so much about the gift that we're giving, it's about what's happening internally. Uh, and, and maybe just that's a, a thought to reflect on as we enter into our giving. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that all that we have is yours. You are the most generous God. And so we're so grateful to you for everything. And, and now in this moment, we, we give back to you, not because you need the gift, God, but because there's something in our hearts that needs to be generous. And what you'll do in our hearts is so important during this time. Um, so Father, we give to you knowing that you're going to do exceedingly and abundantly more, knowing that we get to give to your mission to, to heal the world. And so we, we offer this to you now, Jesus. Uh, in your name we pray, amen. I mean, thank you so much. Our team can uh, pass the baskets around now. Uh, Martin, that hat is amazing. Can we just quickly all look at Martin? How good is his Christmas hat? If you don't have a, a little light-up hat, you should get one. Um, just to let you know, we've obviously got Christmas coming up. And uh, after Christmas Day, which is on Tuesday, our offices will be closed. And they'll be closed until the 2nd of Jan. And there is no service on the 30th of December. So if you arrive here on the 30th, 30th of December, you're going to have an amazing time in our car park, and, uh, and I really hope that you enjoy that. But there is no service on the 30th of Jan. Our offices will be closed that time. Uh, of, yeah, there will be a service in Jan. You're right, Kev. Uh, 30th of December, and uh, we'll be back on the 6th of Jan uh, next year. Uh, but as I said, it is Christmas, and, and we have an amazing, amazing Christmas service planned. Uh, Christmas Eve tomorrow, and, and Christmas Day on Tuesday, and our services are going to be awesome. Uh, genuinely, they're going to be really cool. And, and uh, you've got these invites on your chair. Uh, you'll see them there. How, they're beautiful. They really are very beautiful. I think they're very pretty. I think it's the right word. Um, but these aren't just for you. These are for you to invite your world. And so maybe that's something that you'd like to do. I'll just tell you a little bit more about that now. If you do call Grace home, this is your church, and you, you know that you're going to be coming uh, to a Christmas service here, I really want to encourage you to come through to the 3.30 service or the 7 a.m. service. And most of the other services are completely packed out. And so those are, the, those are like the best services to come to because uh, you can sit somewhere. And that's always a real benefit. Uh, so I really would encourage you to come through to the 3.30 p.m. service or the 7 a.m. service. But you've got these invites, uh, but sometimes it's a bit awkward to invite someone to a service when, you, when you've got to explain, like, what do you wear, how do you dress, uh, what's it going to be like. And so we've put a, a little video together to, to explain what, what it's like to be at a Christmas service here at Grace Family Church. So if you're visiting us, maybe you would just lean in and, and learn what it's like. But if you do call Grace home and you've got someone that you would like to invite uh, to Christmas, maybe you can share this video with them. It's on our social media. Share it with them, tag them, send them the invite. Uh, but this is what Christmas is like here at Grace Family Church. Why don't you turn your attention to the screens and then our worship team will continue to lead us after that. Hey everyone, I'm Sam and here's what you can expect if you and your family are thinking about coming to a Christmas service at Grace Mshlanga. First of all, just like you, we love Christmas and we love celebrating with family and friends. All are welcome at Grace. No matter your age, your culture, belief or background, there's no dress code or list of requirements you have to follow. You are invited to come as you are. We recommend you arrive a little early for our Christmas services because they can fill up fast. If you've got time, then take a seat outside while you wait and enjoy the stunning view over the Indian Ocean. Kids love Christmas at Grace, so please do bring them with you into the service. 
We've got some fun kids items planned for them that they don't want to miss out on. Sit anywhere you'd like and get ready for a service full of festive fun, laughter, learning and Christmas carols. Our services are just an hour long and you don't have to be worried about being singled out or feeling out of place. You'll find at Grace we are pretty relaxed so you can sit back and enjoy the lights, music and Christmas message from wherever you may choose to sit. This year we have five identical Christmas services at our Umtlanga campus. Christmas Eve we meet at 3.30 and 5.30 p.m. And on Christmas Day we meet at 7, 8.45 and 10.30 a.m. If you need any more details, go ahead and take a look at our website or our social media pages. We've got a fantastic Christmas planned and this was just a quick look at what you can expect. We are really excited to have you join us here at Grace as we celebrate this special time of the year together. Won't you stand with us as we continue to worship? I'm going to ask Busi to read to us from a passage in Matthew chapter 2. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the reign of King Herod. About that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem asking, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it rose and we have come to worship him. And the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the, chi the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with his mother, Mary. And they bowed down and they worshipped him. Friends, just as the wise men sought out Jesus so that they could worship, here we are this morning as a community of faith. We're here to worship the King. So regardless of whatever it is that you're carrying in your heart today, can we just encourage you to let it go for just a moment, to allow yourself the space to be overcome again by the goodness of God toward you, by the love that He has for you, and allow yourself to respond as we worship Him. Cause you were the word at the beginning One with God, the Lord most high You're hidden glory in creation Now revealed in you, our Christ What a beautiful name what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, cause nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus.
death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, you silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are open. Just someone else's story. Some chosen people get a special king. We leave them to their own peculiar glory. We don't belong. It doesn't mean a thing. But when these three arrive, they bring us with them. Gentiles like us, their wisdom might be ours. A steady step that finds an inner rhythm. A pilgrim's eye that sees beyond the stars. They did not know his name, but still they sought him. They came from other where, and still they found. In temples they found those who sold and bought him. But in a filthy stable, hallowed ground, their courage gives our questing hearts a voice to seek, to find, to worship, to rejoice. divine star and angels gave the sign bow to babe on bended knee the savior of humanity unto us a child is born
beautiful song to reflect on, to pause, to prepare in the season, a song that encourages us to, to come and see, to come and see what Christ has done, to draw near, to draw in, to witness his amazing love, the, the light that entered into the world and changed the world forever, to come and look, to come and witness, an invitation to draw near and to draw in. And that's the invitation for us. To, to reflect, to look in, to, to witness God's amazing love. I, I wonder if you just join me for a moment of prayer. God, we thank you uh, for that Noel, that first, that first moment of wonder and awe. God, you with us. And uh, just for, for each of us today, wherever we are, God, in our journey with you, won't you just speak into our hearts and to, to just get a glimpse of your love in this, in this moment. Thank you that you're here. Thank you that you meet us. And we just commit ourselves to, to that discussion and to that journey. We pray these things in your name. Amen. 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 As I listened to that uh, song, as I reflected on those words, uh, beautifully sung by Katie, but, but as I reflected on them, I was inspired and provoked uh, to ask some questions. As I listened to these words, I, I kind of thought, is it something that's worth looking at, this story, this nativity story? Is it something that's worth actually looking at? This gift, this gift that's been given for us, is it something worth looking at? Is it something worth being drawn near to? We sing of this amazing love and this light of the world that entered in, but I'm kind of inspired and provoked to ask the question, how amazing is it? How do we know the magnitude of the greatness of the gift that's before us? How can we have an understanding of the magnitude, the greatness of the gift that's before us? Now, now perhaps for some of you seated here this morning, uh, perhaps for some of you that's going to be the first time, or this is the first time that you're going to ask those questions. You're, you're new to this discovery of faith, this journey of, of understanding if there's more to all of this than just simply tomorrow. And you're on this journey discovering for the first time these questions. And, and this Christmas season, you're going to ask for the first time or is it something actually worth looking at? How do you know how amazing the gift really is? For some of you sitting here though this morning, there's a real encouragement to pause, to reflect, to, to, to mark a moment and ask yourself again how amazing this gift is. That we would not in this season of, of fast-paced traditions simply rush past these moments of mystery and wonder. And there's an invitation this morning, if anything, but maybe over the next few days, there's an invitation to reflect, to be drawn near and to be drawn in again. 
and to ask the question, how can we know how amazing this gift really is? And I suppose to, to get us on that journey and to, and to create a, a space for us to reflect on this gift, this light of the world that entered in, we need to be able to ask a question that helps us discover that. And, and so I want to pr- uh, propose a, a simple, profound, hopefully profound question to you this morning, and, and it's this. How do we know the value of a gift? How can we know the value of a gift? Now, I understand that that's potentially quite a sensitive and, and risky question to ask just two days before, uh, before Christmas. And in, in no ways am I trying to give you some ammo uh, to sit around your Christmas table and go, thanks for the socks, mom. Um, they're awesome, right? I'm not trying to give you ammo for a really awkward Christmas uh, lunch conversation, but what I am trying to ask is the question, how do we know the value of a gift? I think there's four ways that we can discover the value of a gift. There's four questions we can kind of ask of, of a gift to understand its value. The first one is this. How much did it cost the person giving the gift? How much did it cost? Now, I'm not trying to just like, imply that it's about the financial cost. Uh, perhaps to illustrate that a few years ago, a few years ago, many years ago, when I was but a young lad, um, we were, that's, that's only a few years ago for you, Dudley, um, but uh, we were, I think I was about 12 or 13, uh, so it was just the other day, and, um, and Christmas was, that year was kind of tough for us financi- financially, and, uh, and I just started paddling, canoeing, and I really wanted a new paddle. Um, and they weren't cheaper, they, 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 but I really wanted one because I wanted to enjoy the sport that I, I had grown to love. And, uh, and I told Father Christmas, I told my mom, um, and so I said, hey, this is the thing, you know. And, um, and so Christmas came around, and it's kind of with like that eager anticipation, I ran towards the Christmas tree, kind of hoping to see something longer than the Christmas tree uh, beside it. And uh, there was a little card uh, next to the Christmas tree for me. And uh, my mom had written a letter, and she'd drawn a picture, and her drawing's terrible, um, but she'd drawn a picture of the paddle, and she wrote next to it, I owe you. Aww. That year, we weren't able to get, get anything, but, but it cost her heartbreak. We can know the value of a gift by how much it cost the person giving that gift. We can also know the value of a gift by how, how little we deserved the gift at that time. Parents, you know this to be true when you've threatened that you will not get anything under the Christmas tree, and yet we still do. We know the value of a gift by how little we deserved receiving it. We know the value of a gift by how freely it was given, and we can know the value of a gift by the incredible benefit that we receive as a result of getting that very gift. And I think if we're able to look at any gift in our lives and ask those four questions, they're provocative potentially, but maybe this season... We would reflect on on Christ with us, light of the world that came down low, and reflect on these four things. And I want to ask those questions when it comes to Christ, and when it comes to, to Christ's love for us. How can we know this season, entering into the next few days, how can we know the depth of God's love for us? How how can we understand or get a, a renewed understanding of how precious this gift is? How can we determine the brightness of this light for us? And like I said, I really think it's an important question to ask at this time of the year. I think it's so, so important for us, for every single one of us to engage in, these, in this question, to not simply let the next two days rush past us in tradition and, and, and ritual, but to be able to be present in the mystery and the wonder that is Christ among us. God in human form, born into a world of chaos and, 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 and madness, that the Savior of the world would be, be born into that. That we wouldn't just simply miss that, but also, I think that these questions and, and this understanding of God's love for us, the depth of His love for us, how precious this gift is, I really think it's something that every single one of us should engage in. We should all engage and wrestle with this question to know and to get an accurate understanding of God's love for us. Just how valuable this gift really is that we would move through the season not simply just celebrating the gifts and the family occasions, and yes, those are good, but I think that when we get a greater sense of God's love for us and how precious this gift is to us, then we can truly celebrate over the next two days the wonder that is Christmas. And that's what this season of Advent is about. That's what the last two weeks and, and today is about. Advent is about, about preparation, preparing our hearts for the gift to come. 
You know the, the, the truth of this reality. When you know the very cool gift that you're getting, despite the fact that you know you're getting the gift, there's still that, that, that sense of wonder. You're still so excited to get that thing. Unless it sucks. And then you know. And then it's like a bit more disappointing. But, but Advent is about pre- preparing our hearts for the gift that is to come. That we would enter into the season with a thrill of joy and an incredible hope. And today that we would get a glimpse of God's love for us. And I think when we can prepare our hearts around uh, getting a glimpse of God's love and understanding the depth of God's love for us, we can enter into the season prepared and perhaps experience it anew in a fresh way. And maybe for some of you here today that you would enter into the season with the fresh discovery of just how great God's love is for us, just how great this gift is of Christmas, why it is that the world celebrates this moment, this peasant born in a stable. Why do we celebrate it? Uh, Paul, encouraging the church in Ephesus, compels his audience to engage in the depths and understanding the depths of God's love for us and for the world and for them. He writes these words in, in Ephesians 3. He says, and may you have the power to understand. And this really is my hope for us this morning, that we would just get a glimpse of God's love, that you may have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep God's love is, how deep his love is. And may you experience, and this is my prayer for you this festive season, this Christmas season, and may you experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to fully understand. Let us prepare our hearts to get a glimpse of this love, and let us ask ourselves the question, how can we get an understanding of the depths of God's love for us? How do we know how precious this gift is? And in preparation, I came across a great sermon by, by a pastor called John Piper in the States. He's a pastor and a theologian, and, and he gives us these four reflections around understanding the depth of God's love for us. He kind of says that if we want to understand uh, when someone performs an act of love towards us, the magnitude of the, that love, there's four ways that we can understand the depths of that love. The first one is this. We can know the depth of someone's love for us by what it cost them, by what it cost him. We can know the depth of, of someone's love for us by what it cost him. Uh, Chuck Colson, who, uh, was the, um, who was the special counsel to Richard Nixon, uh, President Richard Nixon in, in the States, uh, and uh, he tells this story, this incredible, incredible story uh, of a prisoner of war uh, a sort of internment camp um, during World War II. And the story goes somewhat similar to this, and, and, and he, he tells the story of a platoon of American soldiers who'd been held captive. And uh, there were 20 of them, and they were held in, in, this, in this labor camp. And every single day, uh, this group of 20 soldiers were given 20 shovels and made to go out and work in the fields for the whole day. I don't exactly know what they were doing, but I'm guessing it wasn't fun. Uh, so every single day, they went out, and they were given 20 shovels in the morning, and they'd come back in the evening, and they'd count 20 shovels, and then they'd go to sleep, and the next day, and the next day, and the next. But one day... Uh, The soldiers were given those shovels, went out into the field, came back in the afternoon, presented the shovels, and the guard who was there counted the shovels and counted only 19. And in that moment, uh, in in a rage that one of these these prisoners would would lose their shovel, would would throw it away with abandon, and not care about the resource that was given, and I'm guessing it was just basically an opportunity to inflict hardship and pain, the guard says, where's the other shovel? And and he threatened uh, to, to kill five men if, the, if, the, if the, the perpetrator didn't step forward. That there was one shovel missing and he would kill five if one person didn't step forward. There was a, a moment of silence, five to 10 seconds, and then suddenly this young 19-year-old soldier stepped forward and said it was him. He lost the shovel. And so the, the guard uh, took the young man aside and shot him in the head, killed him. And then walked off, and as he was walking away, he turned over his shoulders and threatened the other prisoners, don't ever lose a shovel again, don't ever lose a shovel again. And so they gathered around this young man, and as they gathered around him, one of the other soldiers counted the number of shovels, and there were 20. The guard had miscounted. And I wonder in that moment, as those soldiers, as those prisoners of war gathered around that body laying on the ground, I wonder what emotions must have been stirring up in their heart and in their mind. That as they knelt over this young man who in a moment, in five seconds of silence, decided that he would step forward. That, that in that brief moment, he weighed up his future and his, and, and his hopes and his dreams and his aspirations. He, he dreamt of a family, I'm sure, of a wife one day and maybe children, a new car, a new house, maybe celebrating a birthday with his dad. He weighed all of that up and in that moment decided it was better for him to die than five others. 
and he stepped forward. What emotions do we, do we hold on to in these moments? Jesus said this in John 15, greater love knows no other than this, than one who would lay down his life for a friend. And it's important to get an illustration, or perhaps a sense of, of understanding the greatness of God's love for us. See, we can tell the, the greatness of someone's love, the depth of someone's love by what it cost them. By what it cost them. Speaking of Jesus, Paul writes to the church in Philippi, he says these words in Philippians 2. He says, though he was God, that's his position, that's his status, that's no mere title to attribute to someone. The status of God was though he was God, Jesus did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. There is no greater act of love than the act of sacrifice. There is no greater act of love than the act of sacrifice. We can know how much God loves us by how much he was willing to sacrifice for us. He gave it all up. All his divine privileges, all the beauty and the mystery and the wonder and the awe of heaven, Christ gave up to enter in and come down low. He gave up the magnificence of heaven for the manger. So it's important to pause on that sometimes because I think we, we sometimes just briefly pass over the, the nativity story. The creator of the universe with all his divine privileges chose to be born into the midst of chaos and disorder. And not only that, but in the, in the chaos of the manger, he would have the cross before him. We can know the depth of someone's love for us by how much it cost them. And we can know the depth of God's love for us by how much it cost him. It's an important thing to pause in the season if we're going to have an understanding of how valuable the gift is that, that's before us. If we're going to have an understanding of how bright the light is in our world, it's important to understand how much it cost him. The second way we're able to, to know the depth of someone's love is to, is to know how little we deserve it. When we, we're able to know the depth of someone's love for us by how little we deserve it. Now, parents, parents, you know this to be true, right? And, and kids who are in here, just, just block your ears, it's fine, just listen for, in for a bit. Um, but, but we know this as parents. If we're all honest, right, those little things, when they come into the world, they've done nothing to deserve your love. I'm just going to be honest here with, with you for a moment, right? Uh, they've caused nothing but upset and discomfort for nine months. Amen, ladies. And then that whole like gift-giving process, that's deeply unple unpleasant. And then you don't sleep forever. Awesome. And yet, and yet, these little things have done nothing to deserve our love, and yet we love more than we've ever loved anything in this world. They have done nothing to deserve our love, and yet we love. We can know the depth of someone's love for us by how little we've done to deserve it. Uh, reflecting on this, Romans 5 says this, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ, by sending Christ to die. There's the sending and then there's the, there's the, the, there's the end result. To die for us while we were still sinners. You and I, we had done nothing. We have done nothing to deserve this gift. You and I have done nothing in our lives and we can do nothing for the creator of the universe to receive the kind of love that's bestowed upon us. Even before you were born, before you were a twinkle in someone's eye, God loved you. Even before the moment you were conceived, Christ was born. This gift was given despite the fact that, that, that it was given to a world who didn't deserve it, to a world that wouldn't really receive it, to a person who didn't deserve it, to someone who doesn't always live like it was given for me. We don't deserve it, and yet Christ gives it freely. We can know the depth of God's love for us by how little we deserve it. And maybe this Christmas season you would reflect on that. It's not a hugely encouraging thought, but it's a very powerful one. We, the third way that we can know the depth of someone's love for us is in the freedom to which the gift was given. We can know the depth of someone's love for us by the freedom with which they love us. Um, so uh, my guess is you all have different Christmas traditions, right? Um, and, and Christmas looks different in every little home and all that kind of stuff. In my family and sort of like my extended family and group of families, friends, and, and those that have adopted us and all those kind of things, um, we, we play the number Christmas gift game. 
I don't quite know the actual title to this game, but let me explain it to you for those of you who don't know what it is. Everyone gets a value, right? There's like 100 rand if you're like at a normal house. If you've got a really fancy house, it's 150 rand. And you have to buy a gift for that value, whatever it is. I always buy biltong because I always want biltong. And so I buy 100 rand's worth of biltong. You all wrap it up, you put the gifts in the middle. Does anyone know this game? I've got any hands here that's, that play this? I, I can see that hand. Um, and, so, and then you, you draw numbers. So if there's 30 people, there's 30 numbers, and you all draw a number from the hats or the tree or the whatever you draw a number from, the beer glass. I don't know what people draw numbers from, but you draw a number, and then number one picks a gift. They open the gift, and then that's them. They're done for the day. Then number two picks a gift, and they then pick the gift, and they unwrap it, and then they look at the gift and say, do I want this, or do I want number one's gift? So number one really is in the best place, right? And then the numbers go, some of you know this game. Does anyone know the game? Um, and you get, eventually get to like number 15 and you're kind of in the middle and it's not a great place to be, but number 30, oh, number 30, you know you don't like that person already. And my guess is this has caused some real division and some real hurt and some real pain. We have an amazing counseling center here at Grace. I really want to encourage families to like be drawn to, towards each other. Um, and, but I just want to quickly pause here, right? Here's my, here's my contention. And actually, we had this argument, I think, the other day with Leanne, um, who's an elder here at Grace, and so we had a good argument. Um, I think number one should go again. I don't think it's fair that number one picks first and then they get nothing. It's also because also I always get number one, and so I'm just trying to like <laughs> move myself forward. But here's the thing. I've never really walked away from one of those games, even if I was a good number, really stoked with the gift that I was given. Um, and, and sometimes you, there's really only one person in those games that gets the cool gift. But that moment when someone says to you, I want that gift, and you, and you go, no, you don't. You want that person's gift. And then you, it's like, there's this like, weird argument, and you know you're going to lose, but you enter into the discussion anyway, and you barter for the youngest child who can't really speak, and you try to get them, you know. <laughs> I'm just giving you some tips here. But here's the thing, right? When you take that gift from someone in, that, in the midst of that circumstance, there's no joy <laughs> There's joy when you're stealing it, don't get me wrong. But very seldom, very seldom do we rejoice in a gift that was given out of duty and obligation. Very seldom do we, do we reflect back on our lives and look at the gifts that were given out of obligation and duty and go, that was awesome. It's the gifts given out of freedom and in joy and in absolute love that are the most precious gifts to us. Isn't that true? No matter what their value is, no matter what their size is, no matter how big the box is, it's the gifts given out of love and in freedom and in joy. Those gifts are the gifts that are most valuable to us. No matter what their value is, they're the most precious things to us. And it's the same with God. It's the same with this moment that we're celebrating now. If Christ had come out of obligation, if Christ had no choice but to come to this world, it would be no gift at all. But God did not send his son out of obligation or out of duty. He sent his son out of love and in absolute freedom. We know these words, John 3.16, it says this, for this is how God loved the world. And these are important words to let sink, let sink deep into our hearts. This is how we know that God loved the world, that he gave his, only, his one and only son. There's no clause at the end of that. There's no because he had to. There's no second sentence there that says, and so that people would respond. It was a simple act out of love and, and generosity and joy and an absolute freedom that God sent his son for you and I. We can know the depth of someone's love for us by how freely, how freely the gift was given. And this gift was given to a world who didn't deserve it, and yet it was given so freely to you and to me. The fourth way, the fourth way we're able to know the, the, the depth of someone's love for us is by the greatness of the benefit we receive in having been loved. It's by the benefit we receive as having been loved. We get, you and I sitting here this morning, and, and those who are on this journey with God, we get the most incredible benefit because we're loved by God. Because Jesus came, because he was born into the midst of madness, because, he, because he, he lived and he died and he rose again, it is through grace and grace alone that you and I get to receive the incredible benefits of being called children of God. What an incredible benefit is, is to a kingdom that we didn't belong to, you and I get to step into. 1 John 3 says, see how very much our Father loves us, for we are called, for, we, for he calls us his children. And that is who we are. You and I receive incredible benefit as the result of God's gift to us. We didn't earn it, we didn't deserve it, but we receive its benefit. We receive life and life to the full. 
we, we receive because of what, what Jesus did for us, the very power that rose Jesus from the grave, the very power that lived within Christ, you and I get to receive that power because of what Jesus has done, not because of what we've done to deserve it. It's an unmerited gift to you and I. We didn't deserve it and we didn't earn it, but yet he gives us that same power to live with. We receive forgiveness when we should have received condemnation. We, we receive hope in the midst of circumstances when we should be sitting in despair. We receive healing when we don't know why. We receive love from a God despite the fact that we haven't done anything to deserve it. You and I, we get to receive life and life eternal with the living God, the kingdom of heaven now and the kingdom of heaven forever. This incredible benefit given for you and me and we did nothing to earn it. We can know the depth of God's love for us because of, of, of the benefit that you and I receive as the result of the gift. And, and my, my hope for you this season, as we enter into Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, is that you would take a moment to reflect, that you would take a moment to sit back and, and to ask yourself, this light that, was, that has been given to us, this light that was being poured into the world, how do I know its value? How can I understand the value of, of the gift that is Christ? And we can know its value by understanding how much it costs God. We can know the value of, and the depth of God's love for us by, by how, how little we did uh, to deserve it. We can know the value of, of God's love for us and the depth of God's love for us by, by how freely he gave that love. And we can know it because of the benefit that we receive as a result of it. This is, this is my hope for you, that you would reflect on the depth and the wonder and the mystery and the magnitude of the gift that is before us. And I wonder, reflecting through the service and to the, and to the, to the scripture that Pussy read to us, I wonder if it is this sense of, of understanding, this perception of the gift that was before them that led the magi, the wise men, the kings to bow down in reverence before Jesus. I wonder whether it was these men and just a little side note, we don't know if it's three, we think it's three, we don't know if it's three, there was three gifts, but there could have been more than three wise men. That's a mind-blowing fact right there. But these, 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 these wise men, they, they were searching for something. They'd been searching and searching for, for, for something significant to come into the world, for something life-changing to enter into the midst of their circumstances, and then they saw a star. And it drew them into a place of reverence and wonder. As, they, as the star stopped over the place that Jesus was born, they were filled with joy. Why? Why were they filled with that joy? They'd been on this journey trying to discover something. And as they entered into the midst of the mess that must have been the manger, their first response was to bow down and worship him. I wonder that maybe what happened in that moment was that they saw the value of the gift that was before them. Tiny as he was, as messy as it must have been, that as they saw the king of the universe lying in a manger in the midst of that chaos, they, they got a sense of how, how, how magnificent this gift really was. That they would know, having been on a journey, how much it cost the creator of the universe to come down low. That they would have a sense of how little they and others had deserved this gift that was born into the midst of that place. And that they would have a sense of how freely it was given. These, these men, these, these wise men who'd been studying scriptures for years and years and years, perhaps they had an understanding of the incredible benefit that would enter into the world as a result of Christ born among us. And it was that, it was that sense of the magnitude of the gift that was before them that led them to worship. And my encouragement to you is to get a sense of the magnitude of the gift, to get a sense of how great the love is for us. And that would lead us to, to, to worship and to enter into this, 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 this season of preparation, to enter into Christmas with a new sense of God's love and a new sense of his life for us. But here's the thing. When God's love, when we get a glimpse of God's love, when, when we allow it to enter into our worlds, it lights up everything about us and it lights up everything around us. When we get a sense of, of the light of God's love and we allow it to build up hope and, and restoration and freedom in our hearts, we begin to see things differently. Uh, C.S. Lewis, reflecting on this reality, he said, you know, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the rising of the sun. Not just because I've seen it, but because by it, I see everything else. When we get a glimpse of God's love for us, when we allow the light of God's love to enter into our hearts, not only do we believe because we've seen it, but because by its light, we see everything else differently. And that's my hope for you for this Christmas.
that not only would you see the light of God and it would light up brighter in your hearts than it ever has done before, but by it you would see everything else. May we have this Christmas season a new perspective on the love of God and the incredible value of the gift that was given to us. Now, now here's the thing about a great gift. You know this to be true. When you receive a great gift, you can't not but tell others about it. You can't not um, do anything else other than tell others about it. Uh, some of you know that there's going to be a really nice T-shirt at, on, under your Christmas uh, tree. And you're going to wear that Christmas T-shirt at Christmas lunch because it's a cool T-shirt. The kids are going to unwrap an amazing drone. I don't know what kids get these days. But, but when, they, when, when you unwrap an amazing gift and you're filled with that sense of wonder and joy, you can't not but tell others about the gift that you've received. And that's my hope for you this festive season, that not only would you look at the light of God's love and allow it to take up a a new place in your heart, but that you would allow that very light to to shine into other people's hearts and minds and lives. And there's so many different ways that you can do that, but but it starts by first looking at the light and allowing the light to transform you. Start in that place, but then allow that light and that love to enter into the world around you. Here's a a little Christmas tip quickly. Um, It's called incarnational influence, and it's just two fancy words that I put together because I wanted to sound intelligent, but incarnational influence. You see, I think here's the thing about our world, here's the thing about my life, here's the thing about our society, and unfortunately, I think here's the thing about the church over many years. When we see something that's wrong in our world, so often our response is to point at it and tell it to change. When we see a societal issue at play or we see something wrong in Uncle Jimmy's life, so often our response is to point at it and tell it to change, to stand at a distance and say, that's not good. And the church has done that around so many issues in our world. But what I see in the, in the, in the nativity story, what I see in the light that came down is that God motivated by love, by simply that simple fact, by love, he entered in. He, said, he, he, he dwelt among us. He, he was incarnate one with us. And because of the love that that drew him to that place, it was the love that allowed him to influence the world around him. My encouragement to you in this next while is to allow the love of God to to place you in situations where you can see change. And I think that's how we allow the light of God's love to influence the world around us. We don't stand at a distance as if God would stand in heaven and just point at us. But we follow Jesus' example and we step into the midst of chaos. We step into the midst of those situations. When Uncle Jimmy's telling you all his hectic stories, instead of just like fobbing him off and saying, whatever, Uncle Jimmy, get to know him. Get to engage in his life. Step into those situations. Be incarnational, not because you have to, but because of love. And that love will change people's lives. Step into the midst of the hurt. Step into the midst of pain because you've been loved. And because love changes everything. Can we uh, just reflect on on those four questions as we we wrap up our time together? I want to just ask these questions to you again. And maybe they'd be questions that you reflect on. Uh, Heather's going to put them up on the screen. But we can know the depth of God's love. By what it cost him. By how little we deserve it. in, In the freedom with which they love us. In the freedom with which God loved us and the greatness of the benefit we received in being love. As you look at the gift that's before us, the light that entered into the world, may you reflect on those things. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the magnitude and the wonder and the mystery and the incredible nature of the gift that you gave us. God, we thank you for uh, just, just its, its, its cost to you and, and how little we deserved it and all these things, God, but, but the freedom in which you've given it to us and the benefit we received by it. Help us, God, in this festive season to, to reflect on the depth of your love and to perhaps a new or in a renewed way get a sense of how much you love us and how much that gift has changed our lives. God, we commit ourselves to you in this endeavor. We thank you for the time that's before us. Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. I mean, the last thing that I just want to encourage you, uh, I spoke about, you know, this, this, this love that changes our hearts and our minds and, and, and allows us to have influence with the world around us. One of the things that you can do, really simple, is invite someone to the Christmas service. Again, you've got those invite cards. They're not just for you. They're for someone in your world. Uh, won't you just send that invite, give that invite to someone and invite them to join you at one of our Christmas services. We hope to see you tomorrow or on Tuesday. Have an incredible rest of your day and a very Merry Christmas. Amen.